Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. You have made my life complete, and I love you so. Alright, so today we're going to talk about the love affair between Romeo and Juliet. Alright, so let's consider the relationship between two lovers that we're going to call Romeo and Juliet. Now, it's not unreasonable to believe that their relationship is going to be dynamic. I mean, things change over time. So the question is, how will Romeo and Juliet's feeling towards each other change over time? Okay, so let's build a mathematical model that describes Romeo and Juliet's love for each other as functions of time. So we're going to use r of t as being a function that describes Romeo's love and hate for Juliet, and j of t as being Juliet's love and hate for Romeo. And our model is going to be such that positive values for these functions signify love, and negative values mean hate. And the larger the magnitude of r t and j of t, the stronger the feeling. All right, so let's construct our first mathematical model for the love story of Romeo and Juliet. So let's first write the following equation for the rate of change of Romeo's love. Let's assume that it is proportional to Romeo's love itself. And similarly, we're going to assume that the rate of change of Juliet's love is proportional to Juliet's love itself. And now we want to understand what is the behavior of the solutions for that model. So what is the rate of how, how does Romeo and Juliet's love uh, evolve in time? So we have to distinguish between two cases depending on the signs of the coefficients. So let's just look at Romeo's equation first. So if the coefficient is positive, what that means is that when the right-hand side is positive, so Romeo is in love, then the rate of change is also positive, so his love increases. So basically this is what we would call a passionate lover. Because the more he's in love, the more he's in love. And similarly, the more he hates Juliet, the more he hates her. On the other hand, if the coefficient is negative, what that means is when the right-hand side is positive, so when Romeo is in love, the rate of change is negative, so his love decreases. And similarly, if he hates uh, Juliet, then his hate decreases. So he's what we would call a cautious lover. So he doesn't want it to, doesn't want to be too passionate about love. So this is how we would describe the behavior of the solutions here, but we can do more because these are very simple equations. It's in fact, it's fact, it's just two different separable first order equations that we know how to solve. And we know that the solutions here are, to be ex are going to be exponential functions. So we can, re we can really describe in detail what's gonna happen. So for example, if we just sketch the graph of Romeo's love as a function of time, what are we gonna get? Well, it depends on the initial conditions, but it'll get something like that, for example. So either it'll just keep increasing forever, or keep decreasing forever if the coefficient is positive. And on the other hand, if the coefficient is negative, then it would just go and decrease forever. So the yellow case here would be the passionate lover case, and the uh, pink case would be the cautious lower case. And then we would get the exact same thing for Juliet because the two equations are just precisely the same. But this is a fairly boring model because the equations are what we would say decoupled, right? So it's like if Romeo and Juliet don't talk to each other, right? That both equations are independent. Romeo's love uh, evolves without having anything to say about Juliet's love and Juliet's love evolves without having anything to say about Romeo's love. So that's a pretty kind of boring couple, right? So let's try to make the model a little more interesting. All right, so let's look at a second model when, uh, in which Romeo and Juliet actually talk to each other. So let's take the rate of change of Romeo's love to be, in fact, proportional to Juliet's love, and the rate of change of Juliet's love to be proportional to Romeo's love. So this is quite different. And again, we have to distinguish between two cases depending on the signs of the coefficients. So if we focus, for example, on the first equation, if the coefficient is positive, what that means is that when Juliet is in love, so the right-hand side is positive, then Romeo becomes more and more in love. So this is what I would call a mirror lover. And similarly, if Juliet hates R Romeo, then Romeo hates her more and more. But if the coefficient is negative, then it's the other way around. If Juliet is in love, then the right-hand side becomes negative, 
and then Romeo becomes, oh, he doesn't like it very much. Well, if Juliet hates Romeo, then Romeo gets all excited and starts loving her. So this is what I would say he's playing hard to get. All right. And of course, the same applies for the second equation. But now we would like to say more and see what the solutions actually look like. So let's look at a special case. So let's take, for example, first coefficient to be 1 and the second coefficient to be minus 1 so that the equations look like j and dj dt is equal to minus r. All right, so we haven't seen how to solve such systems of equation. But here, uh, it's pretty easy to guess what a solution could be. So if you take, for example, r to be a sine function, then you see that the derivative of a sine function is the cosine function. So j should be the cosine function. And indeed, this also satisfies the second equation here. So that's one example of a solution. And we can sketch the graph to see how Romeo and Juliet's love evolve. So let's start with Romeo's love. So this is going to be in pink. So it's a sine function. So it looks like this. And Juliet's love is kind of... Uh, doing similar things, but just something like this. I'm not very good. They shouldn't meet here, so this is hard to sketch. Should be like this, something like this. All right, so that would be Juliet Slav for Romeo. All right, and in fact, here we can see that the most general solution is in fact a linear combination of, of sines and cosines, and the most general solution for that system of two uh, differential equation would be for Romeo's love to be any linear combination of sine and cosine. So there's two integration constants here, a and b. And Juliet's love would be then a times cosine of t minus b times sine of t. And it's easy to check that if you take these two functions here for arbitrary constants a and b, they do solve this system of differential equations. All right, that's cool. But it's not always easy to find explicit solutions for a system of differential equations. So just like when we studied autonomous differential equations, we use the phase line as a way of getting qualitative, understanding the qualitative behavior of a solution without solving the differential equation. Now we want to do the same thing for a system of two differential equations. So what we want to do is sketch uh, solutions in the phase plane. So now instead of a line, it's now becoming a plane because there's two functions. So more specifically, what we want to do is uh, draw a plane where the two axes corresponds to the two functions that we're interested in. So in this case, it would be Romeo and Juliet's love. And one, then we want to draw trajectories in the plane that correspond to the solution. So as time evolves, we would just move along one of these trajectories. And the idea is to pick some points in the R and J plane and evaluate the right hand sides of the equations. And these will tell us the value of the derivatives, which will tell us the tangent direction, so the direction that the functions are changing. So let's just do it with an example. So if I pick the point, say, 0, 1 in the, point, in, the, in the plane here, so that corresponds to r being equals to 0 and j equal to 1, then using the differential equations above, I see that dr dt and dj dt are going to be equal. The r dt is j, which is 1, so that gives me 1, and dj dt is minus r, which is 0, so that gives me 0. So what that means is that at the point 0, 1 in the phase plane, the tangent vector to the trajectories is in the direction 1, 0, so it goes like this. right? And then you can keep going. You can pick some more points to figure out what the tra trajectory will look like. So if you take, for example, the point 1, 1 in the phase plane, then just plugging this in the system of differential equations above, I would get that the derivatives dr dt is equal to j, which is 1, and dj dt is minus r, which would then be minus 1. So if I pick the point 1, 1 here, so this was 0, 1, so the point 1, 1 would be somewhere here, for example, and then the vector corresponding to the tangent to the, the direction here of the trajectory would be 1 minus 1, so it would go like this. And you can keep going like that, and you see in this case, I'm not going to do all the calculations, but you see that what you end up with for your trajectories for this particular system of differential equations, sorry, are basically circles in the plane. So the trajectories here correspond to circles of different radius, 
and which trajectory you rely on depend on the initial conditions of the differential equations. So what we're doing here is what's called a phase plane analysis. So let me be a little more precise and explain what phase plane analysis is in more detail. So if you're given a system of two first order differential equations, so here I'm taking my functions to be x and y as functions of time. So in my previous examples, these were Romeo and Juliet's love. So what we want to do to understand the qualitative behavior of the solutions is to draw trajectories in the xy phase plane that corresponds to solutions of the system of differential equations. And the way to do it is to pick values. So you pick a whole bunch of values of x and y, and then you evaluate the right-hand sides of your two differential equations. That, give you, that gives you the value of the vector at this point, which is in fact the tangent vector to the phase plane trajectory. And with this, you can basically sketch the trajectories and that gives you a very good understanding of the qualitative behavior of the solutions without having to solve explicitly the system of differential equations. All right, so we looked at two different mathematical models for the love story of Romeo and Juliet, but in fact it could be a lot more complicated. So you could take Romeo and Juliet's love for each other to follow a system of differential equation of that sort where the right hand side is some sort of complicated linear combinations of the functions r and j. And in fact, uh, one of our professors, Dr. De Vries, did build uh, an app with her former PhD student uh, to study the love affair of Romeo and Juliet in more general terms. So if you are interested, I'll post a link on eClass so you can have a look. There's a whole introduction here and there's some case study, but there's also the experiment, experimentation, experimentation tab here, which is kind of interesting. So there's a little nice, uh, a nice app here. So you can choose your coefficients here. You can play around with the parameters and there's two graphs that appear. So the first graph is just a graph of the functions r of t and j of t as functions of time. And the second graph is the uh, graph of the trajectories in the phase plane. So you can play around with the initial conditions, uh, Juliet's parameter, and you see you can get all kinds of nice things. Oh, you see, this is cool. And then you can try to really understand what, what does that mean for the love story. I mean, what does it mean for Juliet and Romeo's love for each other? So if you are interested, just go on the app. I can tell you, you can play around with this for a very long time. It's really fun. Let's go back to our model number two for the love affair of Romeo and Juliet. And let me ask you the following question. So what if Romeo's name was Xavier instead of Romeo? And what if Juliet's name was something like Vanessa? Well, well, what would happen is that the function r of t would become the function x of t, and the function j of t would become the function v of t. So the equations here would become dx dt is equal to minus, sorry, no minus, is equal to v, and say dv dt is equal to minus x, and then I'm going to reintroduce the constant here instead of setting it to minus 1, I'll put minus k over m. Well, what is this? This turns out to be nothing else than what's called a spring mass system in physics. Isn't that cool? So what is this? This is basically you have, you know, a mass which is connected to a wall, something like that, by a spring. And then you're looking at Newton's law, and the mass is under the force given by the spring, which is follows Hooke's law. So what happens is the following. So the physics here is that the force is given by the mass times the acceleration, which you can write as the second derivative of the position, and it's also equal to minus k times the position by Hooke's law, where k is a constant, the spring constant. But this is the same as the system we had above, because if we take the first equation, we can take the derivative with respect to time, we would get d2x dt square, which is equal to the derivative of the velocity, but substituting the second equation, we get minus k over m times x, which is nothing else than Newton's law for the spring mass system. Isn't that cool? So the key here is that we can turn a system of two first order differential equations into a second order differential equation. And this is something quite general. And in this particular case, we've seen that uh, the solutions of that system are linear combinations of trig functions, which are indeed the solution of the spring mass system in physics. And in fact, the spring mass system is an example of something more general in physics called uh, the harmonic oscillator. Uh, this is something that is extremely important in physics. And in fact, there's a, a, a beautiful quote by a very well-known physicist called Michael Peskin, 
which says that physics is that subset of human experience which can be reduced to coupled harmonic oscillators. I think that's a great quote, so this is a good way of ending this video.